guys and let me act like I know how to drive this tool. Oh, actually, it almost hardly matters. People see, uh, you know, see the little slide deck okay? Yes, I do. Cool. It's okay. Yeah, I see it oh. fine. Thanks. All right. Um, if if this is okay, I'm just going to go ahead with it like this. At any rate, uh, I think it's. Uh, by the way, I think that's the best. You, it, if you hit full screen, it doesn't get much better than that anyway. Yeah. Well, I have I have kind of a high res monitor. Don't know, but anyway, cool. So as long as people can read it, um, just for the record, I'm I, I'm Dave Barrick, and we're going to talk a little about uh, t the TCP timer implementation I put together for use in the. Uh, fast data stack and really you know folks are are welcome to take it use it for what it's worth and uh enjoy it i guess these are really purpose built tcp timers they're not necessarily intended for other applications i'm using a two level wheel algorithm it's pretty standard stuff the design and scale parameters are are worth discussing quickly the timer granularity we set not totally arbitrarily at 100 mils i'd be easy enough to change it to 50 or 200 mils depending on whether you want to increase the run rate and jitter the timers deliberately a little bit or back it off because you just simply aren't needing it from what we can tell uh researching the topic uh, the maximum TCP timer we found in a number of places is, uh, you know, is around two and a half hours. And uh, that, you know, that's, you know, in, in ticks at 100, 100 mils, that's 150 minutes or 90,000 ticks, rounding up to 256K ticks for reasons, uh, you know, you can you can well imagine when you get into doing uh, you know, symmetric wheels of a power of two in size. Uh, you get uh, five level, uh, five, you know, five twelve slots per wheel, uh, two level scheme, which is about a seven hour max max duration. You can, um, you know, again, if you wanted to change to 50 mils, you get three and a half hours. This is probably okay. Um, I've tested to 20 million concurrent timers and you know, in rough numbers, which you'll see in the test code after a bit, you get 28 million quote operations per second, where an operation is start a timer, cancel a timer, or expire a bunch of timers. So that that metrics, you know, it's it's only good for the the fluffy slide. It's not really good for um, much of anything else. Um, the timer wheels, if you're not familiar with the algorithms, it's an odometer algorithm. If you think of, uh, you know, if you think of the odometer on a car, you have a, a fastest moving wheel, and when it rolls over, it clicks the wheel ahead of it. And, you know, in a way, it's vaguely related to uh, the Enigma machines in World War II, which instead of doing, you know, uh, wheel slots with timers in them, we're doing cyclic permutations. And uh, you know that that was you know it's a sort of it's 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 a kind it's a, it's a funny kind of algorithm that people don't often necessarily um, have a bunch of, of uh, stick time on coding, and the idea is when a fa you know when the fast wheel finishes a complete revolution you bump the slow the slow ring one slot on um, the fast wheel slots are, are one timer tick and the slow wheel slots are one complete revolutions worth their 512 timer ticks or 51.2 seconds at each slow wheel tick you pick the timers out of the slow wheel slot throw them into the fast wheel um, you do this actually before processing the fast wheel in case you had a timer that was, you know, zero mod 512 in length, meaning it just goes, you know, it'll want to go into the, the fast wheel slot that you're expiring right now, please. So in terms of APIs, this is pretty basic stuff. I'm in a... Can I ask a, can I ask a naive sure. question? Yeah. Um, is the slow wheel, is the slow wheel bigger? Like, uh, I.e., have more timers on it than the fast wheel. I well, yeah, you'd or, you'd imagine it'll get you'd imagine that that uh, depending on well, depending on the distribution, it could be totally empty if all your timers were, you know, fifty one point two seconds or or shorter, it would end up with nothing in it. But that you know that clearly isn't the case. Oh, I, I see what you mean. okay now I, now we get it. So the slow anything that's kind of like let's say more than fifty seconds out, it stays on the slow wheel. So if anything from like fifty seconds to yeah. two hundred and fifty two hundred and fifty six um almost at two hundred and fifty six thousand ticks, 
it, it stays on the slow it stays on the slow wheel. It's only when it, it, it temporarily gets close within fifty seconds that yeah. it gets moved on to the fast wheel. Yeah, okay. bingo. I got yeah. you. Bingo. Yeah, I, would, and I, would, I would basically expect that most of the timers for TCP for connection are going to be within the first wheel. Yeah, yeah. I imagine so. Occur at once, but I mean, there's yeah. others that'll that'll span up of that. But that's fine. yep. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, you know, the whole, the whole idea of it is, the, you know, the fast wheel goes around and then the odometer clicks over. And what you do is, if you think of it as sort of, you know, two, you know, two pies or something with slices, you know, uh, you know, what what you do with the slow wheel tick is you pick all of the timers out of that slow wheel slot, and as you'll see when we really go through the code, you distribute them into the fast wheel wherever they're supposed to go, because now you've gotten within one uh, fast wheel trip around the track of of the timer expiring so so i do like i on the cadence i come back and on the, that cadence i do almost i do like an rdtsc you read where i currently am and then i go look at the head of the fast wheel and i kind of say okay yeah, how many yeah, things can i pop off yep yeah. let's let's yeah you'll well you'll see you'll see how it works yep um okay. i have one question to the yep yeah i mean uh, for this like uh, 100 millisecond of this slot like uh, if we have a like very very fast network and uh, do we expect like this uh, list will be growing super fast if we are not clearing them enough with uh, if it is a like, shorter slot like uh, 50 or less Probably it will be clearing up the list a bit faster or something. Well, all all existing all existing TCP um, you know uh, TCP timer implementations use a granularity that's actually actually greater than uh, greater than 100 mils. The point being, what you what you expect to do is a packet will show up. You'll say, oh yeah. Okay, we don't, you know, we don't need this timer to time out. You're going to clear the timer, restart it, and process the packet. That mostly you don't expect in, in normal operation the, these timers to pop at all. That you're probably going to spend an awful lot of time starting and stopping them, and very little time actually expiring them. You know, unless you, unless it, you know, unless they're being used to retry a packet. But uh, you even, know, I don't think. That even in yeah. like a Linux implementation, you know, that you don't have any guarantees around the timer. You know, it 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 land roughly, land within fifty. I don't know, um, but within within this within a certain number of that six uh, either side of where it's yeah. supposed to land, but it's it's not precise, but yeah. not remotely precise. And yeah, and and in fact, the the uh, the observation out of our TCP go, uh, gods within Cisco is that you're that um, you know, Dave Ward, for example, who's really expert at this stuff, even though you'd never know it for an SVP, um, just saying that he would he strongly suggest jittering the timers by about 25 percent. Uh, just simply so you don't get, uh, you know, that you get a nice, you know, nice distribution of when the timers will actually expire. Now I don't know how much how necessary that is, but like I said, um, within a factor of two either way, 50 mils or 200 mils, we can, you know, we can, you can very easily change uh, change the run rate of the scheme. I mean, it's a little bit hard coded at the moment, but if you decide that you want, um, you know, you want to be more fine grained, you can do it. Um, if we need to change a factor of uh, four either direction, you probably want to change the wheel geometry, and that ends up feeding back into the width of the handles that are used, which feeds back into how much memory the scheme's going to consume. So it's a bunch of trade-offs, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've been completely clear that I'm at the beginning of this. Uh, you know, now having something that appears to be, you know, not nonsensically broken, but we're going to learn. We're going to learn a bunch out of it. The good news is it's not a hell of a lot of code, which has two effects. I mean, one, you can work on it, and two, um, it smallly generally equals fast. <laughs> so, at any rate. I want to talk just at, at a high level about about the APIs involved, which is there's a start, there's a stop, there's a process timers, um, they're you know initialized and destroy uh, destroy the objects. The thought was to use one of these wheels per thread because you know mumble that it'll just it, you know it'll scale, it'll you know reduce to zero the amount of uh, atomicity nonsense involved in it. So that's kind of how I was planning to use it. Um, 
there are two callbacks you end up um, implementing. One of them is the obvious, here's a vector of expired timers, and, you know, these are typical VPP infra, you know, aka CLIB vectors. And here's a vector of new stop timer handles. As you'll see when we go through the start timer code, um, the uh, consumer of this, this API is expected to scribble down a stop timer handle. Now, the stop timer handle, if you think about what we're doing, we're, we're taking a, you know, we're taking an internal object and we're putting it somewhere in this two-level wheel hierarchy. Well, that stop timer, high, uh, stop timer handle pretty much says, okay, it's on, you know, it's on the fast wheel or the slow wheel. It's in this slot and it's at a certain position in the slot. You'll see how that goes. But the bottom line is, um, in order to rapidly stop a timer, um, you, you need to know where it is and not be running around looking. What, what the stop timer handle lets you do is it lets you basically do a single bit bitmap clear to kill a timer. Um, now, if you think about what happens when you take a, a slot in the slow ring and you distribute all those timers into the fast ring, you rapidly realize, oh, shoot, I, I've just broken every, every timer handle there. Well, what you end up doing is you fire off a callback and hand the user, new, you know, you say for this um, object ID, you know, pool index and timer ID, here's the new handle, please remember it if you want to stop it. You know, again, happens every once every 51.2 seconds. The test code version of this thing is maybe seven lines of code, and the real version of it is probably seven and a half lines of code, that it's a really pretty simple thing. And um, the expired timer vector is pretty obvious what it's all about. Um, the the start timer guy takes a wheel index, uh, you know, typical you know typical day VPP speak, a pool index, a timer ID, and an interval in hundred millisecond ticks uh, from from right now. And you know, it starts a timer. When the timer expires, you get it through callback. Um, this call returns a timer cancellation handle, uh, which the caller is expected to memorize if they have any intention of stopping a timer. Um, stopping a timer is really pretty is really pretty straightforward. The cancellation handle is really all that this routine actually needs. Although for obvious reasons, you might want some consistency checking so you don't stop the wrong timer and have and have the the timer you intended to stop actually start. Um, the, the the guts of it uh, w with the you know with the consistency checks uh, turned off as you might do in a in a production image is setting a single bit to zero in a bitmap. Um, the expire timers guy uh, will walk through in detail. Uh, now is expected to be, you know, floating point seconds, uh, you know, since the uh, since the computation started, and uh, you know, it's a pretty pretty obvious where you're going to get that with MVPP. Um, you, you know, a little bit of, of messing around could let you use uh, RDTSC result directly, but uh, the, the VLIB time now game gives you, uh, you know, gives you all of the clock scaling and frequency non uh, nonsense dealt with. So the expired timer callback takes a, a vector of integer, you know, U32 handles, uh, which in code what the uh you know what what the client code um gave it basically across the vector you want to say what's the pool index what's the timer id um traded it off so that the um the uh the maximum pool index is sort of, is you know north of 200 million and that there are 16 timers uh you know supported per uh, you know, poor pool ID, poor presumably TCP session. That's just kind of the way, you know, the way I stuck it together. Um, the new stop timer handle uh, game is pretty much what you see on the slide there. It's, you, you know, you pass a vector of uh, pool index, timer ID, and new handle tuples, and you just process through them. You don't need or want to free the vector, do anything like that. The caller, as you'll, as you'll see when we read through the code, the caller actually does a vec reset length so that you're not, uh, you know, that, that once constructed, this doesn't turn out to be uh, a memory allocator thrash case. So recitations where to find the code, uh, really pretty straightforward. Um, I, I'll, hey, Dave. hey, what? Uh, Dave, um, 
did you ever think of a, a rearming timer that periodically rearms itself, or do you think it's not needed? Uh, it's pretty much not needed. I mean, the right the right way of saying it is when you're expiring them, if you want to restart them, go right ahead. I mean, it's 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 just um, how would you put it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a one liner in the a one liner in the callback. I could do that, obviously, but um, I figure you know. You know, it's it's really you know it'd be really so easy to build it. You know, if folks want it, well, <laughs> throw it in the header file, be done with it roughly. Okay. At any rate, let me um, let me stop stop with slideware and start with you know, uh, shall we say, actual code. Um, oops. Okay. WebEx is jumping around. Let's go get let's go get Mr. Emacs and start doing actual. Start doing something for real. Um, share. Okay, folks, seeing you know, folks, seeing what looks a little bit like code here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, let's let's start with it. Hey, Dave. Hey, hey what? Since you're recording this and you want to publish, that is seems a bit small to me. You might want to see if you can make it bigger. Okay. It, it's going to end up on YouTube, so. Right. No, good Good point. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Meta X set default font. Okay. Try that. Better? Much better, folks. Agree? Yep. Well, it's gonna, yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to create. Looks better. Creep it around. Hey, Florin. I think hey, that's. Hey. I think that's. You. Yeah, it is me. <laughs> oh, good grief! All right, let's let's go for the fast the fast path, getting the screen the right size, so to speak. Sorry. All right. All right. That looks. That looks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, Keith. I. I just. You know. I wouldn't. Oh, oh no! I hit it with the traffic generator. Okay. Any rate. Um, Okay, so what do we have here? Um, I probably need to push a new version that actually has the uh, the doxygen tagging done in it. Um, it'll make it a little bit easier for people to consume potentially. Um, the the wheel slot guy is uh, how do we want to do this? Um, this is uh, you know we have two rings. Each ring com uh, you know comprises 512 slots. The slot looks the slots look like this. Um, we have a, a busy slot bitmap, shocking, uh, timer handles, and fast ring offsets. You're going to see when we start a timer that um, that will com will compute how far you know will compute basically offsets in both rings. And when picking up a timer and distributing it um, in um, Distributing it into the uh, in, into the fast ring, it's handy to keep around the original offset, so you don't have to go uh, dredge up the you know dredge up the uh, the timer or save the uh, basically save the call arguments. That the you know the point in the in the fast ring where a timer expires, you can compute once, save it away, and then use it to distribute timers into the into the fast ring from the slow ring. You know, so the little enum, size constants. Um, this is the argument structure that's passed to the new stop timer callback, which, you know, is pretty simple. It's pool index, the magic handle, and the timer ID. Uh, the, let's see, okay, this is the wheel structure itself. Um, you know, some, uh, some, Timing some internal current tick thing, which maybe needs to be, uh, you know, maybe needs to be a 64-bit number. I'll bet it doesn't actually. I'll bet the wrapping that guy around isn't going to do anything, but should probably try it. I just don't necessarily have the stomach to go run the thing four billion cycles to find out at the moment. Um, the, uh, you know, the uh, array of current indices, the the wheel itself, um, the callbacks. Uh, some uh, some vectors which are saved in the object so that we can just vec reset length them rather than allocate and free them every every time we want them, 
And the stop timer callback, probably had to group the callbacks a little better, huh? Some function prototypes, and that's really about it. Okay, a good place to start is what does it take to start a timer? And literally, what you do is you go do the um, find the find find a, an offset uh, in Dave. Yep. Uh, sorry, can I, can I ask a silly question? So, sure. is each is each position in the ring down the array itself of timers that would need to be called um, at that tick? Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. And it's a and because timers can come and go out of slots when they're stopped and restarted. Um, I have an occupancy bitmap. The occupancy bitmap is really all you need to actually cancel a timer, but it's parallel to the, you know, it's parallel to the vector, which is, you know, to a U32 vector. But it's just to say, oh, I want to allocate one. Well, go do a bitmap, you know, go do a find, you know, find first clear effectively. Oh. Okay, so I get it. So you actually have 500 slots, 12 slots, but you know, the, but not necessarily all slots are occupied at any given time. So or or are occupied bit, equally. And okay, so you might have a loading in one particular place, but none yep. other. So your occupancy bitmap is basically what you check to indicate what what's what's actually yep. what slots are going to fire. But um, yeah, I have, um, the, the actual. Is there an upper limit on how many timers you can have in each slot? No. I, well, I mean, eventually, you eventually you'll run completely out of memory, but it's literally like that. <laughs> okay. Um, right. And and the, uh, the you know the the best way of of saying it is let's let's consider the case where we're starting a timer where the interval is is less than fifty one point two seconds. Well, you come here and you'll say, okay, what's the fast ring offset? And you do you do some dorking right. around to see if um, that off you know if that offset plus the current the current position in in the fast ring is actually around you know is actually uh, you know around the, around the world you need that carry guy I mean it's a sort of um, you know it's like nasty base five twelve arithmetic but you need to worry yeah, about yeah no I I got, yeah, I, I, got, I, got, okay. I got that now so well, we had a new timer. Mm -hmm. I want to add a new timer. So it says, okay, well, how far, it, like, what, what's the delta between now and when that timer is likely to fire? Yep. It indicates its position in the fast ring. So I go to that position in the fast ring and I append it to the bottom of the array. Yeah, well, yeah, you'll you'll see as as, as we get there. Okay, so what you say is now now you know we're in. You know, let, let's do the the simple case first. We say, okay, what's the fast running offset here? Okay, bang, there's the the timer slot. You know the the the, the segment of the fast wheel. You say, go find me a pl go find me a, a known to be a known to be available slot in there, and make the slot be busy and go make the timer handle you're going to give back to the user. You make sure that, the, you know, you, uh, that VEC validator is going to jump, expand the vector if it needs to. Notice that it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's an algorithm where VEC validator is going to do nothing after you've run for a little while. Uh, you know, it's just going to say, oh, yeah, it's big enough, bang. You um, stick the internal handle, which is the pool, I, which is a pool ID, timer ID pair, into that timer handle game in the slot, and then you hand the user uh, his cancellation handle, and that's it. So, you know, the, the key parts are go figure out where in the fast ring it lands and gra grab a hold of it, uh, go allocate yourself a slot, then go, uh, you know, make an internal handle and stick the internal handle into the slot in the, in the, in the you know, at, at the position you've allocated, and then tell the user how to cancel it. The, the slow ring version of this game is real similar to the fast ring where you say, okay, well, now it turns out slow ring offset is, you know, being, um, uh, and now notice that, notice here, we haven't actually done the current position shite. What I've, what I've done is to go compute, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is basically to shift off, you know, two to the ninth worth of bits, add the carry. If that's zero, we're done, and we drop into the fast case. However, if it's non-zero, then we've got to go make the slow ring offset relative to the current position, uh, the current position of the slow ring, and you know, things follow along pretty similar to the fast ring. Now, this this little game. Um, 
you know, of remembering the fast ring offset is exactly as, as described there. It's so that when you demote a, ti uh, demote a timer to the fast wheel, uh, you, you know exactly where to throw it without having to bother the user, ask any question, you know, or ask too many questions from New Jersey. So the fast ring slots actually have two parallel vectors. One is the hand, one is a handle vector and the other is when is the place you're going to demote this guy when you throw it in the fast ring. Make sense? Okay, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, I'm just just looking for now. Stopping a timer is actually is actually you know is actually really simple. It's go figure out what ring we're talking about, what slot we're talking about, and the index in the slot. Um, consistency check, consistency check. Then, uh, then say, okay, bang. Set one bit to zero. The timer stopped. That's that's all there is to it. Um, the the init and free games are really not terribly are not terribly interesting. Um, now we get now we get to the now we get to the real Megillah of expiring timers. Again, probably the right way to look at this is there's a bit of computing which says do some floating point arithmetic and uh, decide if you actually have anything to do. If it's call, if the routine's called early, and ticks could be zero. Um, that you hope people don't manage to you know don't manage to bugger bugger up and call it with now being ridiculous. Um, compute the next you know compute the next run time, the last run time, and now say you were delayed for 300 milliseconds. Well, you'd want to do three wheel ticks. So uh, you know so it's a big old for loop across across the number of ticks. Um, grab the fast, uh, you know, the fast w wheel index, which we deliberately allow to get to 512. In most cases, it's not going to do that, and what you do is really pretty simple. You say, um, you know, clear out that expired timer's handle, uh, you know, the expired handle vector that we've, we've saved away. Um, grab the slot, and then for each set bit, uh, you know, add the add the guy to the expired timer, timer handles vector. Um, zap the uh, you know zap the busy bitmap, and then uh, if any timers have expired and it's not clear that you always will get any, you go bother the user with them, and you bump along bump along the fast string and bump along the uh, your idea of now. That's the simple case, and again, really quite fast. Um, that that the bitmap for each game is uh, is really pretty pleasantly uh, is really pretty pleasantly optimized and really quite fast. And you know, you figure, um, all, you, you know, you you would expect that the that bitmap for each is going to mostly run into fairly dense. Uh, you know, fairly dense rather than very sparse. Uh, uh, you know, arrays. Again, we can we could look at it statistically to see. You know, how big is the bitmap and how many bits are really set. I just don't don't have that in there. Uh, but ultimately, I couldn't think of a better way of doing the problem than you know, here's the bitmap and go. Um, you know, go fish the indicated slots. There may be some. There may be something to be said for trying to pre. You know, trying to prefetch the. Uh, uh, you know, prefetch the uh, uh, you know the uh, the timer handles vector um, to to try and speed it up. But frankly, as I said, what I see in um, what I, I see in the perf CPU, I think the CPU prefetches were probably taken care of anyway, Dave. You know, they're, yeah, they're they're local to each other and they're like they're relatively close to each other in memory. Uh, yeah, I don't don't think your prefetching is going to make any. Right. Yeah, no. Nah. Again, probably not. And like I said, what I see is, uh, the, you know, what I see in a 20 million case is that the the occupancy bitmap is the thing it hits. And I'm not doing an awful lot of churning the timers before they uh, before they. Well, I do do some of that before they um, actually are expired. At any rate. So now the the worst part of it, the worst part of it is the, is the, uh, the is the slow ring processing yeah, before we. But before yep. we go there, can I, can I ask a real basic question? Sure. But there's something something that's kind of bothered me from the start. And why why are you using floating point arithmetic? 
For what? For the time? Yeah, for the time. Sure. Hmm. What, what, what is, what, Hardly me. Well, because it's mumble, because it's basic. It's basically convenient. It's convenient, easy. The floating point unit is pretty bloody fast. We don't <laughs> we don't get a lot of mileage out of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, but it, you know, they... Ray, it's to it'd be totally easy to not do that. As you know, as you can you can see. I mean, you could easily do, you know, uh, or you know, RDTSC and. Uh, you know, and figure out what they, you know, figure out the, you know, ticks per, you know, ticks per second, ticks per hundred mils. Be totally easy to do that. Wouldn't, you know, it'd be three line change uh, really. I, well, it's, it's just curious because it, it, it's relatively infrequent. I'm going to get hit by lightning now for making a, um, a, 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 a statement, but it's relatively infrequent that you come across floating point anything in network code. But it, I just so mm. that's that's kind of that's made me perks my interest why specifically but that makes perfect sense well why wouldn't you yeah uh, the you know vpp does use floating point you know much as you know much as it also uses the uh, the vector units and you know it's just it's it's a re, you know it's a resource uh, uh you know floating multiply add is re, you know is really really heavily tuned in the chips i mean it's odd that networking guys don't ever use it now the, you do ask yourself a big questions about about precision, and one of the things you come to is that um, one calculation I did recently was what you know um, I had someone complaining you know mumble 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 um, why you know why are you using um, you know floating point uh, you know floating point seconds since VPP started rather than floating point seconds since one one nineteen seventy and the answer is that you get to about a hundred microseconds worth of precision because uh, double precision floating point has a fifty two bit stored fifty three bit effective mantissa and you can't represent a number smaller than around a hundred microseconds with a you know, with a bias and a shift back to 1970. Well, yeah, yeah. you know, in this world, it wouldn't even matter because your orders of magnitude uh, slower is slower and less precise than that. But that's, mm. the, you know, that's the whole. Uh, uh, you, you remember that mail thread, Keith? Yeah, it could also be historical, right? Because floating point is generally issued in the kernel. So yeah. since that's people's primary yeah. reference point for networking code. Um, well, yeah, the bug is the the bug is that you have to save and restore the FP registers, and that the kernel doesn't yeah. want to have to save and restore its FP registers when it when it task switches. But in this world, it's going to do it anyway, pretty much. The moment you use mm -hmm. floating point any anywhere, um, and and you know, the, I'm trying to remember. I, I I don't think there's a heck of a lot of floating point. We do do you know we do do timers with it. Um, again, you could do otherwise, uh, you know, VPP as a whole could, but like I say, floating point multiply add has been tuned to death because the graphics guys use it to death. Yeah, and to your point, yes, I do recall the epoch, Unix epoch discussion around timers and rounding up and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, but that that you know, even um, you know, even if you were to say arbitrarily you wanted VLIB time now to return seconds since one one nineteen seventy, it wouldn't be significant below a um, hundred mics in, the, in this context. Um, I wouldn't do that on a bet because you know, frankly, if if somebody ever spun up a VPP that stayed up for the length of time required to run into precision problems, well, I'll be long dead by then. Probably won't care much. And what's inter what's interesting is when you see new instructions come out when, for instance, AVX2 came out, you would typically we typically enable floating point first and then integer later, specifically for using graphics and uh, and uh, single processing kind of workloads. That benefit from it, so you know it, it makes perfect sense to use it. Yeah, and we do we do have some we do have some you know use cases people are developing in VPP that mean the floating point. You know the the way that uh, as I remember the kernel code, it's pretty smart about saying, oh, whoops, floating point disable trap. Oh, okay, start saving and restore. You know, enable floating point and mark the process as needing to have those registers saved and restored. At context switch time, that's, so that's actually a rel that, that's a relatively le legacy thing because I you know, even with VTD today when we uh, save uh, save off and restore the registers mm -hmm. we include we automatically include the floating point registers when we save off stage. So it you know they, having to explicitly do that in the kernel is is kind of a it, it's almost legacy at this stage. 
Yeah. Yeah, but again, you know, I guess the, the expectation is, you know, stuff running in user mode. Uh, you know, again, it's the, the, the kernel guys don't want to save their own register, so probably – I bet you there's no floating point at all in the kernel um, for right or for wrong. Okay. Sorry for the distraction. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, this is an interesting topic. So let's see. Uh, I have one question. Just sure. Dave. Uh, do we need to ever, uh, like, uh, rearrange the memory from slot to slot? Because I noticed, like, when you are allocating, every time you are reallocating one by one, increasing, uh, to, are we freeing the memory, like, if we need it for other slots, like, uh, for this slot probably? Is it ever necessary? No, the, the, the idea the idea is um the, the individual slots will be vec you know, are are vec validated every trip around the track. That's only going to change the world, rock the universe for you know, some small number of, of trips around the track until the thing settles down. But the idea is to basically never touch the memory allocator once you've got the vectors. Um, you'll see, um, you know, this this game, the VEC reset length game. Uh, as soon as you've reset the uh, the, the busy slot bitmap, um, the the, uh, the the corresponding entries in the um, you know in the handle vectors are are they're effectively been freed, and you know that's really all you need to do. It just did idiomatically. The busy slot bitmap is your friend. Hopefully, nobody will ever stomp on it. Uh, that would be that would be particularly a bad thing because it'll make the timer the timer code go totally nuts. Sorry, reset length. It just resets the length, or it's just trying to free the allocation memory. I'm well, there's serious. okay, okay, yeah. The, what go what goes on is that the um, the you know the bit you know the bitmaps basically say within a within a slot within a wheel which you know which entries are allocated and yep. cl yeah. cl and clearing you know clearing the the bit you know clearing the bitmap like so and then resetting its length to zero means uh, effectively you know effectively you freed the memory without actually freeing the memory. You know that it's you know that it's logically marking those marking every slot you know every uh, every element available. Um, so, but you are not returning the memory back to the system. Or back no, 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 because allocation. because you expected steady state, you're going to have the thing populated the, the same amount the next time the next trip around the track. You know, it's it. This is pretty typical of the way VPP works. That at the beginning of time, a bunch of objects will you know will grow, be reallocated, be uh, be moving around. But once things settle down, none of that ever happens. The idea is to stay off the memory, completely off the memory allocator, uh, unless you actually need it. Okay, but could and, it happen, let's say, for the for the worst case, that you end up with. Um, much more memory consumed that you really need. Let's say you have, let's say we have 512 slots, right? Uh -huh. And let's say we have 1 million timers. Could we have 512 million of entries in these vectors in some seems, really seems pretty. Case? Seems pretty mm -hmm. unlikely. Now, notice that there's nothing to prevent you when you've, you know, when you've cleared a slot. There's nothing to prevent you from vec, vec freeing the underlying vectors. Uh, the initial negotiating position was until somebody sees it misbehave, I wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, it'd be a one liner. It'd be a one liner to do occasionally. You could occasionally. It would, it would be relatively expensive, right? Yeah, it's relatively expensive, and the one thing that absolutely would happen if you start doing that is you'll fragment the heap. I mean, yeah. that that's not a that's not a guess. But, that's but just. But thinking through what Constantine was saying, so if you if you were really yeah. unlucky, you could potentially, uh, if you're really really lucky, the best case, you would hit the same that that TCP timer would hit the same slot in the ring every time. At, mm. Yeah, it's more that it's more that the number of timers that hit any particular slot will stay relatively constant. Oh, uh, yeah. That, makes that, sense. that you know, that uh, again, you know, probably ought to add some statistics monitoring so that if over a period of time, uh, you know, one slot gets overloaded, 
Um, the comment about jittering timers is is re, is well taken in this exact context that you know you you'd you'd find it pretty unlikely to get anything except almost a uniform distribution over over a long enough period of time. Right, you know that if you have one million, ten million, twenty million timers, uh, that you'd probably find them uniformly distributed across the slots. The vector's never growing. Now you could construct a case where you get all of the timers in one slot by simply starting all of you know starting you know twenty million to expire in one tick. That I guarantee yeah. you will make that vector that big. But um, the, in real life, yeah, you're depending a little on statistics. It's perfectly possible if you see a slot growing, you know, growing to an, you know, growing and having a very sparse uh, occupancy bitmap, that that's really the thing to do. Is if the occupancy bitmap gets sparse enough to where you're wa you're you're wasting a bunch of time on it, maybe you want to, uh, or put another way, the occupancy bitmap actual length is way greater than the number of set bits in it maybe you want to uh, you know maybe you want to actually uh, actually trim the underlying vector mm -hmm. could could imagine doing stuff like that it's probably probably worth noting down certainly wouldn't do it on day one <laughs> um, no no it's fine I totally agree with you that it's very yeah. unlikely I just like no, to no. understand no, no, it's, no it's a good it's, it's a good you know it's truly a good point and I think I think in stumbling around and mumbling around, I probably came to a fairly decent, a fairly decent way of telling if it's, you know, if, if a slot is messed up in that way. That if you get a slot with a hundred occupied bits and a tremendous number of zeros at the end of the bitmap, uh, which is easy to tell, you just, uh, you know, you just take the the effective size of the, you know, the the, re, the allocated size of the bitmap. And look at it, and look at the number of set bits you get. You could, yeah, you could do something and say, "Ah, oh, this slide has gotten really messed up. Let's, uh, you know, let's make the world reallocate it." Probably wouldn't do it any more often than about when the uh, about when the fast the, the the slow ring ticks ahead one. But yeah, that's a good point. Let me, I'll, I'll write it down. Thanks for that one. Okay, you have about eight minutes left. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, I'm just, yeah, sorry, I'd too much hot air. <laughs> my, my apologies. At any rate, so so the, the the quotation fingers exercise for the reader is to figure out what happens uh, when the slope when the fast wheel has gone around once. Well, it goes around once when when the fast wheel index, which is uh, you know post you know which is uh, post incremented, uh, goes around one. You you bump the slow uh, you bump the slow slot uh, the slow ring ahead by one. You know, you know, uh, you know. Deal with the ring wrap case. Grab things out of the slow, uh, slow guy. Then this is a, a classic Dave avoiding the memory allocator uh, strategy, where you just reset the vector lengths to zero. You walk the slow ring slot, picking up uh, the timer handles for uh, you know the the, the timer ha the user timer handles that you're going to need to uh, tell him. Oh, here, here's a new cancellation handle for you. Um, uh, you know, basically add them, you know, a little bit of poisoning the slot. Then you, uh, you know, guitar lick for clearing the slow ring occupancy bitmap. Uh, and now you deal the, the elements into the fast ring and you hand out new timer cancellation handles. Well, you remember we memorized, uh, we, we memorized the offset when we started the timer and the timer handle, you know, it's fairly obvious. You go grab the fast ring slot there, and um, you know, this this is the standard. You know, go go put a timer into the slot. Um, the internal the internal handle won't change because all all we're remembering down in the timer code is the pool index timer ID pair. Um, the you know as it says the user stop time, timer handle needs to change and you just make a new one you vec you vec add it and if if there were any guys you know notice this could end up being a you know for j equals zero j less than zero kind of you know kind of uh, who's your daddy case um, 
you, you go call the user's uh, stop timer uh, callback. I'll show you the one in the test code, which is 97% of the implementation you'd ever need. And then we're back falling into the fast ring. Notice you want to do the slow ring first in the case where the fast rings come all the way around because you may need to then expire timers in slot zero in the fast ring. You just have to do it slow ring, then fast ring. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Well, the test code is actually is actually you know test code Uber Alice. Um, this is this is pretty much the entire uh, you know the entire um, you know the entire uh, expired timer callback I was using. I've scribbled down in in the test objects the 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 tick they were supposed to expire at, and I do a little bit of you know a, a little bit of checking. Um, this is to uh, extract the uh, you know extract stuff from the uh, from the handles. I probably had to make an inline an inline or one of my nasty macros to do that more pol politely, but you know there you have it. Um, in fact, I certainly ought to do that. Let's see. The new stop timer handle callback is almost to be stolen verbatim. But what you do is you uh, you know you get a, a pointer to the vector element, which is a, which is a triple saying pool index timer index new stop timer handle. So you know that's that's pretty much what it does. The timer ID I just decided to use a non-zero one, so I was reasonably sure that uh, I hadn't, you know, borked something so in a silly fashion. And that's what it does. At this point in the game, um, I ought to shut up and let folks ask questions. So. Uh, another, another silly question is, I didn't see your DTSE at any point. I, right, you I won't. Or if I miss, or if I miss something really funny. No, you, you, you really, you really didn't. I mean, the test code just synthesized. Oh, the test code actually. Yeah, let's see. Uh, point one oh one, if I remember. Okay. You know, here, here's how the test code decides what time it is. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, that means you can debug the code really fast. But literally, what you're doing there is you're just saying that the time has just moved forward by. By uh, one uh, by. By just epsilon over one tick, so you don't get numerical instability. Okay, so just get just over one tick. And um, but what you would do in a normal circumstances there is you'd have to, you'd actually have to count, compute that for more DTSC, right? Oh yeah. Well, what, what what you'd end up end up doing in real life is you'd end up with a per per worker thread. Um, uh, you know, in the main loop, you'd probably just call you know VLib time now. And you know that'll give you the foot. That'll give you exactly, exactly. You know, floating point now. Okay. okay. I mean, that, okay. It, it, so, yeah, that makes per that makes perfect sense. So, yeah. And, so, well, another option is just to change code a bit to use uh, integer sixty four values, right? And sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, yeah. That. That's. You know. If you look at what the expire wheel guy would be, I mean, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty hmm. sure that that isn't going to yeah. challenge challenge anyone very much. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, again, however people want to use this or choose not to use it, uh, you know, is totally fine by me. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't hate it at all if uh, folks just uh, directly use RDTSC. You know, this okay. code in reality depends on a ti the tiniest little bit of VPP infra, and it's sort of predicated on the I you know on the idea of doing uh, y you know VPP infra pools. But it, any of that could be uh, you know rototilled and recycled in you know a couple hours probably at the most. Okay. You know, and it wasn't re you know the the fact of the matter is this really isn't a huge amount of code. And it didn't it didn't take but an hour or two to get reasonably straight. Um, the the wow. things, well, you know, I, God, I I've been programming for 50 years, and as a result, you know, this stuff is not that hard. I've done odometer algorithms before. The thing that I messed up, I'm mean, going to just tell you the one thing that the one thing that I messed up was um, this line right here. That's the one thing that I really messed up in the beginning of time was you have to realize that there that it, you're doing sort of base five twelve arithmetic and that there is it is possible for there to be a carry, you know that that when you say 
um, you know, it's it's not it's not quite as simple as um, modulus remainder that you do need to worry about carries because the the wheel's not always at zero zero you know zero zero island. It's not at the place on the globe that's at latitude zero longitude zero. And you know you have to worry about you know worry about incrementing you know when you increment the fast ring around you may you know you may very well get yourself a, uh, get yourself a carry that you have to propagate into the slow ring and the bug that I had was that when things were an even multiple of five twelve in the future uh, the, the the world would mess up but you know again that's the one that was the worst of it the rest of it is just pretty standard pretty standard guitar licks. Yeah, this is uh I I think we're gonna spend some time looking at this. Um yeah. we'll, well, you can... possible that we'll come back to you in a few weeks and look Oh for, sure. Sure. Uh, no 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 please back. Please, please do, and I'm, you know, I'm 100% up for, um, you know, bug fixes for people telling me that, you know, you blew this, um, so on and so forth. There, you know, there's a lot of tidying up that can be done, but I think the code's in, uh, you know, at least in a, in a shape where it may save you some, uh, may save you some aggravation. It's interesting, you know, they, we had a conversation, an internal conversation myself, Constantine, Keith, and Venki about a week ago. Or it's maybe two weeks ago. I don't know. All the all the all the weeks merge into one these days. But yeah. anyway, uh, so, sometime in the recent past, and it was interesting that the actual conversation, the the implementation that we discussed, looked very was we discussed one that was very 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 similar to this. You know, yeah. we 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 that's kind of we 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 trashed it out over an hour, and this was reasonably close to what we actually came to. And then, you know, it, you, you were implementing it along the same lines. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just. You know, it's not you know it's not surprising. Um, this you know there, there's only so many ways to do a problem like this, and you know the 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 cancellation handle was the thing that I you know that wasn't instantly apparent to me, but it, it you know came to me that if you remembered where you know where in this wheel hierarchy you know you you dropped a timer that it would really cost so little to so little to kill it off and the the occupancy bitmap is kind of a you know is a cute trick and it's easy with the you know with the code in hand to traverse them and so on so at any rate i've managed to waste a perfectly good hour on everybody i no, really not appreciate at all. this this has been this has been fantastic thank you appreciate so much your, for your time. appreciate your uh Appreciate yep. the time, Thanks time so guys, and um, you know we'll we'll immortalize our. Dave, I have one quick question, if you don't mind. Sure, no, go for it. Yeah, uh, you have uh, these dynamic arrays, what you name vector, right, for mm -hmm. bitmap and for storing elements, right? Yep. Uh, if you would uh, have to change to have a fixed array size, what would you go with? Do you have any thoughts about oh. it? Oh. I probably I probably would do I would probably manually make those dynamic arrays. I mean, realistically, you just don't know, and um, you know, There's you some you, way you, to use fixed arrays that would be faster, though, right? Uh, mar marginally. Um, the thing is, the thing is, uh, you know, the 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 arrays themselves. You know, it ends up that you're using just plain old hard pointers. By by the time by the time you're done, you, there's just a little bit of there's a little bit of drama about um, having to put uh, you know put uh, reallocated pointers into uh, you know into the objects a bit. If you, if you ha could have fixed arrays, you could have them local to each other in memory, so mm -hmm. you you could take advantage of the prefetcher again. Is mm -hmm. that what you're thinking, Constantine? Well, not really. Basically, uh, yeah. From one thing. Uh, we don't have this VEC stuff in uh, obviously in TLDK, so we have either to copy it or implement kind of our own. Oh. Second thing about the problem I mentioned, and kind of the one could grow too fast, kind of yeah, you know, kind of if you use a fixed one, it's not clear how it should be each of these like this mapper it should be considered the worst case yeah. scenario. In that case, it's probably waste too much memory, you know, for yeah. for no good reason because that could happen uh, can, very unlikely. Yeah, you can yeah. make your you can make yourself on uh, you know something like you know uh, something like the vector package for 
really awfully little trouble. I mean, I would say three, four screen pages of code will get you what you need to do to do what's done here. And bitmaps are, you know, bitmaps are really simple. And yeah. I, I personally, I'd be, I'd be inclined to just make myself something that, that did these tricks because it just, it makes coding this sort of thing accurately so much easier. And, you know, it's not like it's going to fall apart all of a sudden. Now, all of the objects involved, you know, you're not doing um, you know, you're not doing a tremendous amount of interaction. The, the, only, the only sorts of things you have to remember are, uh, you know, as you grow an array. Now, the, 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 the CLIB or VPP and for vectors grow, you know, grow by uh, three halves when they expand. Mm -hmm. So they're not precisely sized, but the idea is they're not jumping every time you, every time you add one to them. I, you know, I, I would, I, for this sort of a thing, I found that the, the, that vector coding to be really, uh, you know, to be, you know, to really reduce the, reduce the, the, uh, the brain strain and the workload. Um, uh, porting those couple of, of those couple of things wouldn't be, you know, you know wouldn't be bad. Um, I, I don't know. No, I mean, that's, that's one of the options. I'm thinking should we yeah. just copy whatever you have there, guys? Uh, you know, kind of yeah. probably minimalistic copy, or should we kind of? Op is there any other way that could we replace? You know, the dynamic yeah. array with something. Well, you you can certainly you know, you can certainly start with a fairly heavily over provision game, and I guess if you go to allocate uh, allocate in a slot that's that's totally full. Uh, you know, you just jitter the timer at that point in the game. You know, look for the nearest adjacent slot. You know that has room in it, and just say, look, it's not going to be that precise because I'm bloody out of memory, and count them so you can see. Oh yeah, I better recompile it with a different static thing. You could start there. I don't think you'd hurt yourself that way. I mean, it does give you absolutely fixed memory usage. And notice, I haven't killed myself to align anything here. That might be worth doing, uh, particularly with the uh, particularly with the wheel elements. You know, just instead of doing vec validate, do vec validate aligned. Okay. You know, so, no, so, so, you know you're like, just kind of, yeah, start thinking yeah. about, yeah. Yeah, no, well, hopefully, you know, again, this is just by way of, of sharing something that, you know, I think, I, you know, I think is not, you know, disgracefully broken and should be fun for people. I mean, this is a, this is sort of a fun problem when you get into it a little ways. No, no, it's great, great piece of code. I think. Thanks for sharing. Hey, really, no, really no, no sweat. I need to push the version that has the doxygen tags, and you know, you've, you guys have uh, you know identified some things. You know, maybe we really ought to do the vec you know, vec validate aligned, uh, you know, aligned on some of this stuff just to see if we can improve its cache behavior just the least little bit. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to just stop the recording if I can figure out how. And thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, okay. Dad. Thank you.